Chapter 40 You are now listening to The Chapter of the Architect with DJ Architect. What's going on, my people? Once again, I want to welcome you guys. Listen, man, this is Chapter 40. I truly want to apologize to you guys. I know it's been, man probably three to four weeks since the chapter's been out, podcast has been out, but I've been on vacation. I went to Hawaii with the wife, came back for a couple of days, and then I had to go to Houston for uh, for some graduations. Two of my nephews graduated, but here in the studio with me today, two very, very special guests, returning guests, my homeboy, drummer extraordinaire, JJ in the place to be. What's up, JJ? Hey, what's up, man? Hey, I'm I'm happy to be back, man. That last time, you got me hooked on the podcast, yo. <laughs> and, and it was a good podcast. Dude, that was off the hook, man. Yeah. I was like... It was a Halloween podcast. It was a Halloween yeah, podcast, we that's right. Yeah, ghost stories and, you know, good good movies and all that good stuff. Yeah, and, you know, it's just a privilege to be here, you know, having a platform to kind of express yourself and and just, just you know, chew, chew the fat, yeah, you know, as we yes, sit sir. back home in Texas. Yes, sir. Listen, to his left... We have a, a friend of his who, is, you know, I, I was I just met him today, but JJ's telling me that this guy is a professional, dedicated drummer, and he goes by the name of Adrian. Adrian, thank you so much for being here with us today on the chapter of the Architect. Hey, it's always a pleasure, and uh, have, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh all all these things the, from the podcast is new for me, but it's uh, always a pleasure. Yes. Hey, 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 thank well, no worries whatsoever. And I apologize for the mess I've got in the room. I know I got my my traveling bag here. <laughs> <laughs> this is like my recording studio, my my podcast room, and you know wherever my wife wants to put all my junk, she tosses it in here and says, "You figure <laughs> it out, right?" <laughs> Lovely so, place, bro. Yeah, uh, thank you so Honestly. much. Um, so, JJ, I think it was Tuesday or Monday, I'm watching YouTube, and I'm watching, like, you know, uh, VH1 classic albums, and I'm watching classic albums, Pyromania, which my favorite band, Def Leppard, right? Right. Uh, and I'm like, damn, Pyromania, damn, I, you know what, that's a good-ass album, that's a great album, and then I'm watching Bon Jovi, Slippery When Wet. Yo, and then I start, I saw, you know, I start thinking, man, let me get a hold of JJ. I'm like, JJ, we got to come up in here and talk about our favorite albums coming up, you know, in the 80s, and, and and let's do it. And then you text me back, and you're like, yeah, but I got a friend who's gonna be here in the area. You mind if we bring him along? I say, yeah, man, have him make a list as well. <laughs> you know, but, uh, talking about music, and we always, JJ, we always talk about music, man. It's a, it's a great thing that you don't really remember those particular albums because life goes on man you're at work you're stressed out you got to pay bills uh you got a, 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 a situation going on with the dogs and then but when you sit down and you pop in that cd and it just takes you away let's start off with you jj give me and then we're gonna meet obviously we're gonna move on to into different stories but cool. real quick give me jj give me give me two or three of your most favorite albums growing up when you were a kid well the catalog is large the catalog mm. is large the influences are it seems uh, everlasting but you got me thinking about the whole like i mean truly impactful in my life that changed the way that made me like pay attention. I have to. I have to take it back to my dad used to love to listen to the Eagles, mm. and I never realized how how old the Eagles were. Like I hadn't listened to. I I think I started listening to the Eagles in the eighties. They had been, you know, they had already done. Oh yeah, man, their Ho work. Hotel California and in the seventies, yeah. and the and you know, and I had no clue. Mm -hmm. And um, the Eagles were were something that we used to always listen. My dad was a truck driver, and mm -hmm. every summer we'd go out. You know, every summer we used to go out with him on the road. And the, back then, there was no streaming, no no iPods, right. none of that. I mean, remember we used to take those big old briefcases full of cassette tapes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know. I, and I, I remember they had the the eight tracks. 
right? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, uh, I, we're of the same age, right? <laughs> so, right. Yeah, I, I remember uh, getting into a van, and it was like a ColecoVision cartridge or Atari cartridge. <laughs> I'm sorry, JJ. Go ahead and continue. And uh, no, but uh, we used to go down, and I remember we used to have these little briefcases. That it was just full of cassette tapes, and that was the playlist. Mm. You know, whatever you just went right down. You go from A to B, yeah, and you go from front to back. You know, and then you just repeat. And um, I remember uh, listening to the Eagles a lot, and um, that's where I got the this mixture of rock country. You know, in the, that I got that palette for that. You know, and. But you got me thinking the other day when you asked me about like what albums like truly were impactful. And I tried to and and trying to be as honest as I can. I'm going to have to say Slippery When Wet, Bon Jovi. That was a good one, man. And that goddamn Celinda Garza. Man, that, that there was this one girl. I, I must have been in fourth grade. I think. Um, here, here comes the story, man. <laughs> and come to think of it, now Celinda wasn't much to look at, but I think at the time, I think she was like the only one that had some titties at the time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, like everybody had this thing for like Celinda Garza and shit. You know? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we start going at and. Hey, she loved Bon Jovi, yo. Shout, so guess out to, what? shout out to Celinda. Celinda, hey, if you're out there in the radio waves somewhere out there, I still got love for you, girl. <laughs> Shit. And, uh, dude, but she was all into Bon Jovi, and that, that's why I was into Bon Jovi. So mm. I was like, who are these guys? Right. You know, so I was like, I started listening to, uh, what was that album? Is iconic. I mean, it has... Um, uh, you give love a bad name, living on a prayer. Slippery and wet. Uh, yeah, slippery uh, and what wet. What other track? Um, living on a prayer. Uh, uh, dead or alive. Oh, I mean, oh, that's an iconic young guns, track, bro. man. Oh, I mean, my you goodness, know? man. Yeah, there was just so many things that was like never say goodbye. Yeah, there's just so much on that album that are that's forever, that's and a th- it's just as good. That's the thing about it. I listen to those songs right now, and mm. they give you the goosebumps just yes. like when you first heard them. That's yes. crazy. Yes, yes. Uh, give me another album, man. Um, man, and it's, you know what? I think it's just. I think it's just. It goes right along that same um, uh, time frame. You know, you bring up Def Leppard. Def Leppard probably wasn't on my radar until a couple of years after that, but. Another British act that I love to death, and I think it was because of the way they used to sing. Was hey, uh, let me let me cut you off real quick. Speaking of Def Leppard, we're going to the concert in September, right? Yeah, we're on for it, right? And, and that's another thing that we like to do. We go out. We go out to concerts. All together. the concerts. Yeah. All the eighties guys go yeah. out there. We go out there. All right, cool. I'm a, I'm gonna buy the. Uh, I'm gonna buy the tickets. I was on hold because I was kind of unsure if you wanted to go or not. But I'm gonna take my wife. My wife is not a fan of that type of music. Uh, but I'm, you know, I, I, I go to her to her concerts, and you know, she's got to eat it, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but yeah, I'll I'll get four tickets. You and your wife are going, and and Adrian, if you want to come along, man, by all means, man, let's do it. I will. I, you know? I mean, I will try to. I'll this yeah, guy, bro, I'm I know telling you, you're a busy man. Just, I'm I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna let the cat out the bag. Uh, but this guy right here. I, I and I got a little backstory, but I'm gonna wait until he starts spitting it on it, right. and then, <laughs> then I'll, it let, I'll let him have it. All right. So you were talking about uh, another British band. Oh, so and this is a sleeper, hmm. and uh, I don't know if um, if you guys remember the band Outfield. Outfield. Yeah. No. That, it's got that. Uh, Ah, uh, what's that name? It goes, uh, Josie's got a vacation far away. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, yeah, yeah. that's outfield, a jam, yeah. yo. The, yeah. The Outfield. Yeah. And I think I think they're British or uh, or they're from that other the other side of the lake over there. Na, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that, okay. that's my jam, yo. <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's wow. uh, Play Deep album. There you go. Oh, my man. I lo- I'm telling you, man. I like I'm you, man. Adrian, I, like you. I like you, Adrian. Adrian, put the, you got the knowledge. I like that. Uh-huh. And um, and I'm not going to say back in the 80s. I, I mean, it was, I didn't leave. I didn't get out of Bon Jovi, GNR, uh, App- Appetite for Destruction, for Destruction album. I mean, oh my goodness, what can you man, say? That was a it's another album that is like, it's eternal. Hey man, uh, talking about GNR, I know I, I was trying to get you to go with me 
to the concert last November when they were at uh, San Diego Sports Arena. But you're like, nah, man, fuck Axel. I didn't. I wasn't able. I I didn't go. I was I was unable to go. <laughs> that, that 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 sounds like me, right? Yeah, yeah, you, like, yeah. You're fuck like, Axel, fuck Axel. Axel. Yeah. yeah, that's totally yeah. me, compadre. But I was unable to go to the concert. But I had some friends that did go. Oh, I remember why I didn't go. Because the majority of the seats were already sold out, right? But they had a few still, like... Well, they had the staggered seats. If you're in the nosebleeds, right, they wanted, I believe, $80 to $90. That's the very back, right? And then the ones that were available were maybe three or four rows ahead, and those for, were for like $140. I said, what? I said, this. we're talking about feet worth of, of distance, And I said, you're going to go from 80 to 140, 150. And we're not talking about the service fees and all the other taxes and bullshit that Ticketmaster gets you for. And I was like, I'm not going to pay that, man. I'm not going to pay that. I might have made an exception had um, Steven Adler been added to the ticket, Mm. you know, and... um, (laughs) I've always and I've heard I heard this quote somewhere and I, and it and it's resonated forever and it's and this is long before I even played drums mm-hmm. is like you're not a you're not a what was it you're not a fan of the band unless you know the drummer's name hey I you know I, what I'm saying I know the my favorite bands I know all their names right um, I will say this regarding Steven Adler ladies and gentlemen obviously if you don't know Steven Adler is a drummer was the original drummer of Guns N' Roses. He ended up getting kicked out due to drug abuse. You know, the sad thing about it is when the reunion happened and, and the news was being spread out, hey, con- uh, concerts are being put together, he went on YouTube and started putting, recording him playing to live tracks of GNR. And he was legit. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but with within two to three months of him continuously doing it, he would have been in the pocket Hence, my man JJ. Uh, but it wasn't bad. I, I I thought it deserved. He deserved a shot. I don't know why they didn't put him on the 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 tour. I felt bad for him when I found out that he wasn't on the tour and he was really putting out all this effort to kind of say, "Hey guys, look at me. I, I'm I'm ready." Right? right. But they never hired him to go on the tour, and I thought it was sad. But nonetheless. Uh, they were they were crucial. They were impactful in that band, and they're they kind of go. They're kind of like the silent partners of to the success of GNR and Steven Adler. To, in my opinion, and this is just completely subjective, but Steven Adler uh, was a large proponent to that to that team. As um, what's the other guitarist? Every Slash always gets all the credit Easy. for the stuff, but Izzy or Dizzy, right? Is Izzy, Izzy, Izzy Stradlin? Izzy, Izzy he used to write songs. Izzy Stradlin, for, yeah, he was, he's, he's he was a beast. One of the original members of Gun of right. Roses, yeah. He mm-hmm. came out. As a matter of fact, he came out from Indiana with Axel. I'm gonna tell you a, a, a individual who I really really like in that band is Duff McKagan, the bassist. He's gone out and made his own solo albums. There's this one. The album is called Beautiful Disease, and the name of the track is called Rain. Beautiful fucking song. It starts off with a mix of uh, acoustic in the background and the and a lead. It's fucking beautiful. He's not the best vocalist, uh, but the guy's a true musician. And what he what he brings on the side, adjacent from Guns N' Roses, is fucking to me, in my personal opinion, a great artistic value. And when he is with Guns N' Roses, it it, it just it they melt together perfectly. Yeah, I, I definitely have a big, big uh, heart for for Duff McKagan, man. At the basis of Guns N' Roses, last the the last famous musician who saw Kurt Cobain alive. Is that right? Duff. That oh, that's right. Because technically, he's from the that Seattle area. They, they flew together from here from LA to back to Seattle. No way. When Kurt uh, escaped from that. Oh, hospital. oh, Duff is from Seattle, huh? Duff is yeah, from that's Seattle. Right. When Guns N' Roses first started. Uh, you know, getting a little bit of uh, I don't even want to say they weren't even getting noise. Duff was the one that put together the, their Seattle tour because he was from that area and Guns N' Roses. That's how they got a little bit of bang up in that Seattle area because originally Duff was a, a basis for a punk rock band mm. and he has a special on 
Netflix. I forget the name of it, but it's pretty fucking awesome, man. He's sitting there on, on stage with an acoustic guitar, and he's telling stories how he came up in Seattle playing bass in the punk rock man and how he met the guys from Guns N' Roses. It's pretty fucking cool. Give us one more album, JJ. I'm going to say... So, so you gave us Bon Jovi, Slipper, When Wet. When, you gave us, what was the name of the Outfielders, was it? The Blade. Outfield. The Outfield. Okay. The Outfield. And and that, and that there's, uh, in between all that, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's, cool. that's, that's, but I would say that I actually, like, I identify still to this day to, with those albums just because they were at a time, I mean, I was in fourth grade when Slippery and when Wet came out and I had mm-hmm. to think about this. I was in fourth grade. Then I was in seventh grade, I think, uh, when uh, Appetite for Destruction came out. Mm. I mean, those are like influential years mm. in the time. And at, at, at all along this whole time, I'm, I'm listening to another thing, but I, I would say another album mm. that blew my mind. And it's almost in, in conjunction because, and I'm going to have to flip the switch a little bit, but mm-hmm. who remembers when Two Live Crew comes out with as nasty as they want to be right i remember that was a huge controversy i used to listen to that i used to listen to that shit i used to get the 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 boom box remember with mm-hmm. the with the double deck yeah and i would listen to it as low as i could because i felt like i was like like i was uh, violating sinning. he was violating i was violating <laughs> stuff man i was like my you would never thought you would hear, hear that those kind of stuff of coming out right right <laughs> adrian yeah, give us give us your top three albums growing up and and how they influenced you. Um, me as a drummer, mm. I gotta be honest that I got older brothers. They the the one before before me, he's he's still a musician. The older, uh, he's an engineer and he loves music, but he never got into it this way. Okay, but um, I. I'm going to say my first album that hit me up when I was a little boy, it was Moving Pictures from Rush. Oh, such a great band. It started with uh, Tom Sawyer and Limelight and Red Barchetta and YYC and all that songs that hit me up as a drummer and says, you know what? My dad always told us, uh, you need to play, you need to learn how to play the piano. You need to learn how to play the guitar. You know, you need some. Was harp. your father a musician? He still is. What is, what is it? What does he, he do? He plays what? a bass, a oh, bass player. Oh, that is so awesome. Yeah. Man. So he told us that. I says, you know what, dad? Hell no. I got a desk on my school that it looks like a drum kit. So I'm sorry. I got a, a pair of uh, pencils and that's my, my drumsticks. And so I'm sorry. I'm a drummer. And I got to listen to um, uh, that. I mean, Neil Peart, that uh, masterpiece. I mean, he, they did a bunch of more albums together. But I got I to gotta say that Moving Pictures is uh, just a masterpiece of them. Hey, Adrian, let me cut you off real quick. So I could explain to the listeners uh this band rush ladies and gentlemen this band rush is from canada correct exactly right and they're a three-piece band ladies and gentlemen you you have to understand the the layers of music that and the way that they did it uh, for three individuals to put music together just three is 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 pretty remarkable you usually have a minimum of four three is kind of almost like a punk rockish type of band and you really don't get a lot of intricacies with it that band went the opposite way uh they were playing keyboards uh <laughs> oh my goodness and yeah. and let me let me remind you I, I can't remind you if you didn't know right ladies and gentlemen so i apologize but the intricacies within the notes that they would play would would have them going insane because they wanted to do one takes. I believe this is prior to uh, this is all that right. Oh, it's or all real to real, right? This is all analog, right? analog. So totally. there, there, there was no Pro Tools at this time. No, so no. ladies and gentlemen, it's a one talk, it's a one uh, take shot. And if you mess up, it's uh, okay. Well, we got to do this over, and that is extremely difficult to do, ladies and gentlemen. And the intricacies and the notes and the scales that these individuals played, listen, it's something to behold. 
so the moment that that you brought a brush, I was like, oh shit, man! Now I was they they weren't my cup of tea, but I do tip my hat off to the way and and their precision in playing is something to be saluted. Absolutely, Rush uh, Rush was one of those bands that I didn't understand. It was one of those things where I need to I needed to learn how to walk before I ran. And it thank was, you, thank it, you, right? That makes perfect sense. And that's what I think it is that at the time, I mean, now that you, I come to think of it, that I've matured in music, I've learned to really love what Rush did for mm -hmm. the music, and and they were like they're essentially the musicians for musicians, right? They set the bar super high. It's and that's the reason why you don't have that many rush cover bands or tribute bands because it's, too, it's too so difficult. hard. <laughs> it's it too is. difficult to <laughs> learn the music. And you know what? I think that's why, like when you were when I was thirteen growing up and I wanted to learn a song, and believe me, there weren't many songs that I learned, but I always stuck to the ones that I could play with my limited amount of ability. And the damn well sure wasn't going to be a rush song because it would have. Uh, number one, wasted my time. I would have wasted my own time. I can't play that shit, right? So I would play riffs like, you know, uh, Survivor, you know, the Rocky theme. Down, 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 down. You know, very easy power chords, right? But you're right. As as you progress in music and as you become an adult and you you listen and you pay, atten you pay attention to the notes and the musicianship, you say to yourself, oh, my goodness, these guys were way ahead of their time. And and this is when it hits you up because Neil Peart is not the original drummer of Rush. Really? It's a, this they have a, a they did an album with another drummer, but well, he's he got in into I think it was 1974, 75, mm. and um, they did the Spirits of the Radio, mm. and since then until this date, all the lyrics of Rush, they're on your perts. So wow. he's, he's a drummer and he's a songwriter. Wow. And he had like five books. He reminds me of a Phil Collins. Oh, wow. Well, yes. Wow. Oh, my goodness, <laughs> man. Um, but uh, he saw like... Uh, would you consider Rush one of your favorite bands of all time? Could be, yes. Wow. Give us, give us your second album. I'm going to say... Um, I was a little boy, and my, just my compadre sets uh, the outfield. They got this huge drum set, so you're listening to all the love. It was like, <laughs> right? It was like, damn, this band. And I saw them live in back in Monterey, Mexico. So, uh, uh, it, okay, but this album, my compadre just said it. I'm gonna say another. Uh, band that hits me up when I was a little boy. I won an album. I can't remember of the name of the album. It was The Beastie Boys. Oh uh, what the name is it the first album? Maybe or maybe he's Is it the one with the with the jet, the plane tail? Oh my God. I can't remember, but uh it it was like What was the song? Because uh, I, I I remember not listening to the Beastie Boys until they had the the what's that song that's the the one with the no Brass the, Monkey the the, the one with monkey. the teacher the the one that's like famous they're like in the living room or something the video yes the uh, okay so there's License to Ill came out in 1986 that's the one with the tale of the uh, the airplane there's Paul's Boutique which came out in 1989. Everything after that is 1992 and beyond. Uh, let me see if I could... But the, they just did, well, a few years ago, they they continue with that video. Oh, they did a continuation to it? Yes, they did, and it wasn't, they wasn't teacher. It was their parents. Oh, okay. That they were making a party at the house, and the parents came came by, and you know, from vacations, this and that. So they just redid that. No way. And they oh get out. God. They get out of it. And they get, they got out of the. And it's just so it's a, much music. It's just yeah. it's crazy not to. It, we, I mean, we'd be here for months. License to Ill has the song "Girls." 
girls. Do, 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 yeah. do, do. All I really want is girls. Do, 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 do. Oh, I love that one. They got Paul Revere. They got No Sleep Till Brooklyn. That's another with, thing. With, 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 Here's with the a rock. little story I like oh. to tell. Yeah, dude, that that right there was crazy. Awesome. As awesome. a matter of fact, I had written a cadence when we were in the Marine Corps. We had to write cadence sometimes, like for uh-huh. for fun, right? And that's I had. I remember I started my cadence with, with Paul that. Revere. With <laughs> I, I got a little story to tell, and that's how I started my cadence for that thing. No way. Yeah, I mean it's kind of sad we get old and uh, uh, we can just uh, way of living, right? But uh. This band uh, makes great uh, difference between this rock, rap, hip hop bands that got mixed together. They make like live, live rap or live house hip hop. Mm-hmm. So, well, for me, was uh, the first rock rap uh, blend that I ever heard was was. Aerosmith with Run DMC. Okay, yes. That was, and that's what I was that was the first time and that's because of uh MTV and you know all that kind of stuff going on at the time. And um I used to spend a lot of home uh, a lot of time at home. My mom used to go to work. I was be stuck at the house and I had free reign of cable television at the time. And um <laughs> but that's my first experience with the rock rap. But the Beastie Boys was just on a different level, and that's how I got into introduced more into the to the the one thing led to another. The the Eagles with the rock to the country to the to the rock to the rap with uh, Aerosmith and Run DMC. Run DMC walk his uh, way absolutely. Beastie Boys they had that hybrid. You know they've been doing that. You know that's you know they've always been about. Uh, uh, using their influences to directly do what they do, you know. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I was watching the the Anthrax behind the music on VH1. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> which, listen, I, 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 I don't have anything against Anthrax, uh, but I, I recall somebody stating within that documentary, yeah, those are pretty much the forefathers that gave birth to bands like Lincoln, Lincoln Park, and things of that nature, and Limp Biscuit. And I was like, man, hold on, man. You guys totally forgot about Run DMC and Aerosmith. They did Walk This Way way before Bring the Noise with Long Anthrax. Time ago. Wait, I mean, I was watching uh, v, you know, MTV, and I was like, holy shit, what the yeah. fuck is going on? Exactly. And, and so before we get into my spill, but um, so those are two albums, Adrian. Give me, give me one more. I'm going to say I was... I was now uh, in the 90s starting drumming and... You want me to adjust that? No, 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 I'm cool. It's just it's myself. I'm crazy. All right. <laughs> we yeah. all are. All okay. three of us are, are crazy. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to say uh, Frizzly Fry from Primus. This was another curious band hmm. that tried to imitate what Rush was doing or hey but that bassist is ridiculous I know and the drummer more than that bassist for me wow honestly team wow. Herb Alexander wherever you are I'm huge fan of yours wow I just, uh, I'm getting I get the goosebumps right now and there's there's I got a lot of backstories with this guy but we're on our way to Van Nuys, right? We're mm-hmm. going to go see another iconic band to us, which is uh, this great band by the name of Intocable oh. from Zapata, Texas, oh. uh, Texas, where we're from. Right. I'm from that area. My compadre's a little bit further south in yeah, Mexico. Yeah, I've heard of Intocable, yeah. And so I have the privilege to go with uh, this gentleman, you know, to my left. And uh, I'm being ushered down that way. And we're listening. I mean, it's a, about a two and a half hour drive from from our house here to to uh van nuys where right. we're going ventura or to ventura right oh, ventura. ventura fairgrounds yeah. that's a right. mission hell yeah that's a mission yeah <laughs> bro so we're going down the the freeway and we're just you know he grabs my phone he's like what you got in here start scrolling through my playlist and we just started talking about um like different music and genre almost like what we're doing right now mm-hmm. and he goes 
And I go, do you, you ever heard of Primus? And he goes, he gave me, a, gave me that look, <laughs> lifted up the brow, kind of like, the, you know. And then he just starts going through his uh, playlist. Yeah. And he starts putting, um, I think what, what we were listening to, Jerry the Race Car Driver or uh, B- Big Brown Beaver. No, Tommy the Cat. And Tommy the Cat. Okay, there we go. And this motherfucker starts like air drumming to the whole fucking <laughs> album, like note for note. And a, a couple of times I'm going to flew off the fucking road because I'm watching him <laughs> nail all the parts. To, no to way. Tim Alexander's drum parts on all these songs. And I'm like, I don't even fucking know you, bro. I've already, like, I've been with you like for three years and I didn't even know this side of you. Hey, man, let me just say this. I just want you guys to know how much I am enjoying this conversation because it's very seldom that I meet a group of people, maybe one or two, that are so into music that know the insignificant, what would be considered the insignificant members of a certain band, and then they go into these intricate stories and their emotions are building up. I love that because I feel the same way, and I'm going to give my little stories here in a few minutes, but cool. I love that, man. It, it really shows uh, how deep in love people are with music and musicians and the vibe and and what they what they're able to create and it shows a characteristic of beauty of who they are and it kind of makes you fall in love with them even more you know because it's like they're telling a tale with a piece of instrument and it shows a side of of their of who they are of their character and it's fucking beautiful and a lot of people are too narrow-minded to even see that and but i'm in the i'm in the midst of two individuals that that can pick it up, man. So I feel grateful today on this Sunday. Uh, you know, and it's it's surreal for me. And I tell my compadre all the time, and he he's never gonna understand the where I come from in the sense because I'm on I'm I'm gonna mark out a little bit. I can't help it, but my compadre he's part of a band that's iconic in our genre of music mm. in, down in uh, in Texas, and. I can't say I can't say per as far as my plane it was completely uh influenced by the same people that influenced him obviously but long before I even played the drums I was a fan of music I've always enjoyed I've always thought I had a good ear for what I thought was that I thought was good music good, music, good lyrics man. um melody mm-hmm. and there's this band I started listening to back in like 96 97 and um, I just started listening. I was like, man, this is pretty cool. It was outside of the box of what was already considered to be a traditional style of music. Right. And they they just took it to the next level where they were adding uh, keyboards. And and they were just they just had their own identity. And mm. I always said, man, I go, that's kind of cool. Like, and they're, they're, the lyrics are, you can't stop them because they're so good that it doesn't matter what they did. Right. And... Um, the drummer for that band was Adrian Gonzalez, you know, who now sits to, <laughs> to, oh, to wow. my left, <laughs> which is fucking insane, that's, dude. That's because wild. never, I never, I never would have thought in a hundred years that I'd be able to uh, one that I would even just conversate with this person, and then now to be uh, considered a friend, yeah. and more so, almost family at this point. Adrian, and, what's the name of your band? But the one Jay's talking, it's is called still called La Firma. Oh. Uh, we're from we were from Monterey, Mexico. They're still doing. There's they're, they're still playing from mm-hmm. the seven originals uh, uh, musicians. They're not just two left. Right. The singer and the guy who plays the bajo sexto. But um, they're still doing it great. But uh, I start that thing on '96, and I did five albums with them and that's what i think gives me or makes me uh continue with uh this uh, a kind of uh, lifestyle being uh surviving uh, being a musician here and there and and i think that that band uh brought me up here to to California to play with with my with the band that I'm actually now playing, 
What's but, the name uh, of your current band? It, this current band is they're from here, from LA, from East LA, and and it's called Voz de Mando. Mm. They're all on into the corridos, regional Mexican thing. Uh, it's totally different. Of uh, instead of being, I mean, being a Mexican band or being singing things with accordion and mm -hmm. it's Mexican guitar. Uh, it's totally different of, of what we used to do or, or what I used to do with my original band in, in, in Monterey, Mexico. But it's what my, my Jay is saying. Uh, we we get, I mean, there it was a lot of bands with keyboards and accordion mixing and a lot of Tejano doing that thing. But uh, we were uh, like, with, we, we came out with different ideas just uh nothing new because you know this all written but mm -hmm. we just tried to make fun of it and and try to to get uh general people attention and and i think we 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 get the goal uh we were pretty young and didn't know what we're doing in like a, as a business but but i think we did it great i think we we put like that mark on the history of that the, stamp the, they oh. definitely left their footprint you know i i feel ignorant because here i have who i consider a good friend of mine jj jj we we've jammed together we've recorded a song together in the studio he's a drummer i i, I can't even consider myself a guitarist i i, I i'm fairly i'm decent <laughs> but i'm able to do song structures and come up with riffs so he, he is knocking on my door, and here is an individual adjacent to him, and it's somebody who's been putting in work as a professional uh, drummer. And uh, I'm like, wow, he's awestruck. So if he's awestruck, I'm like, damn, who the hell do I have in my studio right <laughs> now? <on. laughs> uh, you know, but and, hey, and I, it's off the subject, but it's, no. it's, it, it's you know, this is the platform. I this is recorded forever. Ah. You know, and that's why I love it. Th that's what I love about this yeah. whole platform and the idea of having the podcast. And this guy right here is in, in some moments you meet some of these people that you think, you know, you have a certain idea. You never know. I mean, you always have an, a, um, a, a perception in your mind what a person's going to be are. like. Right. And in some instances you meet them and they're com and they completely destroy your, the, your the illusion, the perception that right. you might have had of that person. Whether it's negative or positive. Yeah. Right. And, and in the case of my good friend, uh, Adrian, he's, um, he's gone above and beyond. I'm humbled and I'm privileged to be uh, considered uh, in his circle. Mm. And um, because he he is just a big old heart with feet, and mm -hmm. he's humble, and he it's just crazy. I it's crazy, mm. it's crazy, and, and and the and the the his range. And I mean, that's what I could. Uh, that's the only way I could describe it. His range to go from the most elemental p structuring of what our music was, our roots music in our case, mm. to how far he his knowledge base uh in his is his, uh, his reaches it's mm. in, it's insane and i think i've learned in the last 4 years in the last 3 years i've i've increased my music knowledge and my knowledge base um exponentially um major a major component to that is is my friend adrian that's awesome thank you carnal thank you a hey, um Adrian, you got one more album. Oh, mm, I started using that uh, square shirts and industrial boots and <laughs> <laughs> this and that. And, and, and I remember one of uh, four or five in the clock in the morning and I was watching MTV. And on 1991... A, a band called Pearl Jam with oh. his with their first album called Ten, and a song called Alive oh. hits me up. And so, I remember back in the days, uh, getting back from high school, and and mom says, uh, "You need to uh, pick up your uh, your room, or you need to do your homework before anything else." And I always answer my mom, "Mom, I'm gonna." do the album and then I will do whatever you want. Right. So I, uh, I did for a couple of months, I did 
frizzly fry from Primus before Eats after high school. And then I did this album called 10 from Pearl Jam. When, when you say did the album, you, are you saying you played to it as a, a drummer? As a drummer from, from, from start to finish. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Uh, I remember. Uh, so you would play the whole. And we're not talking about a song. You would play the whole album from start to finish. Whole album, yes. Let me yeah. ask you something. To me, I, I would consider this a good question because I'm talking in, in guitarist language. Where as a drummer language, it's to me it's different because they're both physical, right? But there are a hell of a lot more scales on the guitar and frets on the guitar. Then there is snare symbols, and so it outnumbers it, right? The combinations of a guitar are much more numerous and outnumbers the number of percussion objectives you guys have in front of you. Doesn't mean that it's not similar in, in, in easiness. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. My question is when I was. The question I guess I'm trying to ask is, when I wanted to learn a song, I either had to go and try to research tablature, I certainly couldn't read music, and then I would spend, in, uh, dedicate buttloads of time in attempting to put my finger patterns in the, in, and then the strumming in the way <laughs> that it should have done. Yeah. And it's time consuming. A lot of the times I didn't have that patience. Or as a drummer, you would say, you just said you would play a whole album from start to finish. Are you doing all that by ear? Yeah. That's fucking amazing, man. I've witnessed it. Like, he played... I know I know the albums that he's talking about. When we were talking about Primus, and, and I only knew maybe a fraction of the albums that Primus had, because I, I just listened to the, the top five albums. But he knows all the albums and when he's going through the parts and I'm watching him you know where the particular uh, that that drum is going to be for it to be the effective correct sound ladies and gentlemen I don't understand if I mean you're not going to understand if you're not a musician I mean, we're, so we're, we're going mean, to out yeah, here yeah, we're, we're, we're talking like if you're a scientist we're talking about atoms and, and neutrons kind of yes right right we're talking musicianship and and, you know, the intricacies of being able to play and learning a song, it's not easy, ladies and gentlemen, and, and mistakes will happen. So I'm assuming as you're playing to this track, mistakes are happening, but you're oh, sure. but you're adjusting to them. And the next three or four times you play that album, and JJ, he plays the whole fucking album from start to finish. finish. I'm telling you, he went from cold turkey from... Zero. I think we were just, we were just listening to Ramon Ayala prior to that in three four, which is we're kind of geeking out a little bit. But can you we, can you explain what three four is? Because these guys don't they're gonna be like three four what three four hoes? It's your it's your basic <laughs> um, <laughs> it's your basic uh, time waltz, signature uh, time right? signature right. for waltz. You know, uh, technically waltz would be probably be a six eight, but or six. Or what is it? Uh, yeah, six eight. Yes, right? but but it's... anyways, not to without getting too crazy about it. It's um pa pa um pa pa is the boon schmack schmack, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. And um, but he's going from we went from one one side of the uh, the world to Primus, and he's playing all the drum parts like he's air drumming. Like even the eight so, inch splash he's hitting that song. That's what you're talking about. His versatility. It's cr like it's, it's I did wide. not know. It's a huge range. It's crazy. So this whole time you're you're making mistakes as as you're listening to the music, but you're adjusting to them because the pattern continues until the bridge or the chorus, and then you totally. Um, I mean, I start. I was. 13 years old when I started drumming. Oh, man, I was 13 years old when I started playing guitar. I just didn't have your dedication. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were, I mean, I'm, we, I'm talking about these albums when I was maybe 15. Oh, so my I, goodness, I wasn't man. that good as I am today. I'm not saying that. That's obvious. That's obvious, but. But um, I always, I mean, day by day, I this is. And I go back to school, and I was on maybe science or right. spelling, right. Or reading. I don't remember right. what, but I was 
I was on the part that that I can't I didn't did last day that I that I did the song and it's just like how 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 figuring out how he did it and how many do so how what, many hits he did uh, yes the how many hits? hits he did where he did he he, he started with right or he started with left or he did it with yes. double bass drum or what what were the maneuvers exactly what were my, the my compadre my compadre says muscle memory it's like a muscle memory that you need to remind where where it goes and, and how it goes and then with the dynamics acoustic, and then thank you and then with acoustic drums With acoustic drums, it's all about dynamics. It's all about, okay, it's not just about the sequence of where your hand was mm -hmm. and where you hit it. It's about when you hit it and how hard or soft you hit and, it. And it gets... It is. It's, and this is where the... Like, I love my instrument. And, and so if you're playing, like, for instance, on a four-piece kit and the original recording is, you know, a six-piece drum set with you, ha you have to make X it work amount. this gentleman to my left can like decipher like a damn like those damn card things at mm. the damn casino where he's i and i and i do this all the time because it's proven because i ask him all the time i play on a on a on a on a on a smaller kit and i play i try to play drum parts that are usually done in larger kits so we try to replicate the same amount of strokes and just change the voices on the surfaces that are available to us while we're playing and to enable to do that you need to uh, one of the one of the things when it's like deciphering the code is is if you understand what the original setup is for the recording you can kind of you can all like okay he had to start with his left and he's it's almost like reverse engineering it's reverse engineering the song and he can do it on a drop of a hat sometimes and 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 sometimes i don't take in consideration it's just all the the all the experience he has but he's phenomenal though you know i'm i'm gonna which is gonna kind of go into my segue mm -hmm. I, on the way home uh from work yesterday i you know i go to youtube i you know listen to these whatever documentaries or whatever one of my well i can't say one of my favorite band is def leppard right okay Their drummer is Rick Allen. Rick Allen. Yes. Rick Allen was in a car accident in 1984. He was driving his, uh, I believe it was Corvette. Corvette, black Corvette. <laughs> I tell you, my man, motherfucker my man. Tell you. He gets into this piss feud with another vehicle that's not letting him bypass, and then he fucking slams on the gas, and he ends up ripping his his left arm off. And with the seat belt, with the seat belt, my man, woo, you are now. I, I like, I like you. I told you, man, I'm Adrian, you, I, like you. I like you. I'm telling you. you, bro. I'm telling so you. I'm listening to this. It's a, it's an interview that they're doing with Rick Allen, and and they're asking him, hey, how, how did you get the, the strength or not, a, not maybe the motivation of trying to come back and play drums. And he was like, you know what? At first he says, I said to myself, I have millions of dollars. I don't have to do anything. I could just, you know, be okay. And he said that was very, very short. And he said, drums were the thing that saved his life because he said he had this, uh, it was like a piece of foam that would help him get up. And he used that foam and then that foam would become like a centerpiece of a, uh, like a, a, a drum. Right. And then he told his brother, Hey, go home and give me my stereo system. And he put on headphones and he started, he said that he could still feel his left arm, but now he had to process the information from his left arm onto his, one of his feet. So if he's using the right foot as a drum kick, now his left foot would become this you know his, his snare left, he uses his the left, left foot for the snare right his left uh his left hand and he said he would just listen to old songs such as you know uh zeppelin. led zeppelin right so all these different bands and he would just he just kept practicing and kept practicing then he had a buddy who said hey i could build you a pedal but he came back and built him a pedal The cool thing about Def Leppard and why I love the band so much, man, is, the, you know, they never got into an issue where they were like, hey, man, we're going to have to replace him. They were like, well, he's got to have to say it, right? And he never said it. He was like, well, uh, 
you guys are just going to have to give me some time. And he ended up getting an electronic drum kit, which and and his and that's why I know about you know the things about uh you know the acoustic is the percussion. He goes with the, an electronic drum kit, you hit it and it's gonna sound. But then he was stating where if you <clears throat> he would go ahead and have these triggers for samples mm-hmm. on drum rolls that he would hit on the top of the cymbal, like on a certain spot of the cymbal, and it would lead him into this particular cut sample. And he goes, no, that gave me. Uh, different tools to work with and I'm listening to this and I know what the hell he's talking about with sequence and sequencers and I'm like yeah man I do I I it's it's like a math mathematician knowing algebra or you know whatever formula you have in front of you so when he's speaking I'm like holy shit it's like okay he was an innovator so, so ladies and gentlemen I have an Ikea it's sort of like a uh, it, it's an MPD 16 pad and there are pads, right? So every time you hit a pad, it triggers a sound, and you could you could program it to trigger a loop. Mm-hmm. So when you hit it, when he hits it, it can go anywhere from four to two bars, and then he continues on with his writing. Anyways, listening to that, I was uh, very um, astounded. I, I, I felt that this individual had the spirit of someone who loved music, and, and, and real quick, I, I'm, I'm going to get my one album out of the way because I don't want to take up too much time, but my most influential album growing up when I was a kid, uh, and it came out in 1987, was Def Leppard Hysteria. Hysteria. (laughs) Pyromania was very, very much one of my favorites, but it was Hysteria. Hysteria, when it came out, it was produced by an individual by the name of uh, Mutt Lang, Oh, Mutt Langer, they is, you know, but but Shania's rap and, husband, right? Yep, and Shania's husband, and this guy is a beast. What he does, he is. What he is is, he's a producer, but he would cut fragments of a song, so you just wouldn't record a riff. He'd say, "Okay, do it again, mm-hmm. do it," and he get the most perfect take, and then he start deconstructing the take. Uh, yeah. Could he be the? Could he be the one that pioneered like the the punch in punch out compadre? Like no, no, no. That was no, like, that, that was, was already available. Yeah, it was maybe fifteen years before, because I mean he did uh, he did a a lot of great bands, but oh, ACDC. Talking about a, a stereo album, I was seven years old. And I remember <laughs> it was like it was like dreaming being drumming that. So it's uh, I'm I'm gonna say they it's one of the yes biggest albums that hit me up to when I was a little boy too. Yes, and I, I've got to say this because this is this is Def Leppard is the reason why I got into into rock or heavy metal or hard rock or whatever you want to call it. I grew up in New York in a predominantly Hispanic black neighborhood, and it was all hip-hop, hip-hop, reggae music, or or house music. And for you to be a Hispanic or black and be into hard rock was like a no-no, man. It was like, damn, dude, you're fucking the Catholic... (laughs) You're you're fucking the Catholic nun, right? That's We don't do that, right? So I was like always a rebel. I don't give a fuck. Good music is good music. It is. And I'm a tell and I would tell my my black friends, yo, man, I like this band. And they're like, what the fuck, man? Dude, you're Hispanic. Do you like supposed to like Eric B and Rock Cam and then you know uh Cool G rap and L Cool J? Well, I like them too. DJ but I like, Laz. Yeah, but I like I like Def Leppard too. And you know, I, I fucking I like Ozzy Osbourne and what the fuck, right? So I would catch a lot of hell, but I was like, man, the fuck you, man. My La Cruz Fucking home sweets home is is hell of a lot better than whatever fucking bullshit C rated rapper you guys are listening to, right? But I gotta say this about Def Leppard: the reason why I picked up the guitar was because of Steve Clark, the most underrated guitarist to this fucking day. Now Steve Clark died, and I believe was you know correct me if not if I'm wrong, Adrian, back in 1992. Yes, right. He died in 1992. He was you know out in the pub drinking alcohol and he choked on his own vomit. He asphyxiated. Right. Steve Clark was a heart and soul of that band. 
I love this Def Leppard to this day. The moment that he passed away, I was fucking heartbroken. Every riff and every beautiful melody that was ever created, and no disrespect to Pete Willis, which is another one of the original Def Leppard guitarists. Mm-hmm. Um, no disrespect to him, but it was Steve Clark who created, you know, he's considered the riff master. He created all the melodic tunes. Uh, when Phil Collin came in, he was more of the skill driven up and down the neck. He's fucking awesome, but both of them, Phil Collin and Steve Clark together, made the perfect marriage. When Steve Clark passed away, um, Def Leppard, in my personal opinion, lost the heart and soul of that band. Uh, when I listened to Hysteria, Straight Off the Bad Women, uh, Animal, uh, Love Bites, Armageddon, Gods of War, Shit, man, run right. Even the B-side music uh, is just fucking beautiful. Rocket. So Rick Allen was talking about Rocket and the drum pattern. And he was like, yeah, man. You know, the the, the singer Joe Elliott came up to him and said, hey, man, I got this African drum percussion pattern. And Rick Allen heard it and he was like, oh, man, that's fucking awesome. So they created Rocket around a African drum pattern that goes... <laughs> and they created the whole song around it and um i'm only going to get one album but that to me that's it is is def leppard hysteria once again i love steve clark one of the most underrated guitarists in the fucking world that guy is a beast a lot of their melodic music the reason why i ever picked up guitar was because of steve clark I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that Steve Clark was the cookie and Phil Collins was the chocolate, but Mud Lang did, did the <laughs> chips ahoy. He, he did the baking. <laughs> he did the chips ahoy. He was ahoy. the oven. He, he did the baking. Yes, yes. And, and and you know what? To be honest with you, Adrian, I, Def Leppard albums now do not have the same touch, the feel without Mud Lang or or Steve Clark. Bro, uh, bro, it's just 25 years after, you know, it's hard. It's, 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 it's well, it's hard, hard when you don't have the same chemicals. No, in, no, even though batch. we, 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 um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go all the way of, all, all, all around the world, but in Mexico, it's a huge accordion player. They call him the king of the accordion. He's Ramon Ayala. He's been with their, his band, I think. 63 this time? No, no, well, not, that's Cornelio. Yeah, but. no, no. This band right now, 30 years. Yeah. yeah. They haven't had a hit since 2000, um, 1997. And they still, they still sold out. They continue to work. You don't, you, you, you get, you lost, you get lost of that magic and you get tired of it and you get, like, I mean, even though having the same, the same band, you know, the same members, sometimes you get, you do, you mean, just, just run out of magic. You, you will, well, just run out of magic. You're, 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 you're giving me an example such as Aerosmith. Yes. But you, but you got to keep this in mind. Aerosmith, after we thought when their magic was gone in the nineties, they came out with more magic. Happened to Bon Jovi. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, with Bounce. The album Bounce. Listen, man, 2003, I was in Iraq, and we're talking about... So this is 2003. I'm, in, I'm a Marine in Iraq. Bow, bow. Do, 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 do. Oh, goodness. I'm in Iraq. This one's from the broken hearted. <laughs> bow, bow, bow. Bow. I'm in Iraq, <laughs> and I get that album, you know, because, you know, you got CD players, and this is like what his uh, Slippery Wheel Wet came out, what, 1986? Seven, right? That's an ex- eighty-seven, right? Seven. Okay, so we're talking about how many years after the fact. I'm listening to this album and I'm like, "Holy shit, this guy's still making fucking hits." So what what I'm saying is 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 initially is I I wish, well, you know, God, I wish Steve Clark was still alive. You know, number one because the loss to his family, but then the loss to the music world, man. Because who knew? Who knows what other gifts? of melodies and riffs he had to give to the world. And then, uh, you know, uh, look, Mutt Lang went out and produced Shania Twain, which, you know, she came out with great, great hits. And and, and that's just a, a great a testament to his work as a, as a producer and engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, 
Hey man, I, I every time I hear a Def Leppard song from that area, from that era, it, it's the master, uh, Steve Clark, man. And I, I, I will always, to this day, I will always champion him. Uh, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't even know who he is, man. But I will always uh, champion his name. That dude is outstanding and great. But Adrian, let's get back to your roots, man. And ladies, and look, guys, we're already into an hour in, man. But we haven't even gotten into the real core. <laughs> Adrian, so how old were you when you started playing drums? I was thirteen years old. I've been. In what what got you into drums? So you said your dad was was a musician, and you said no, I'm That's at the desk. That's actually a really good story. <laughs> let's it's, get into it's it, brother. Curious because my older brother said, "Dad, I want to play drums." And my dad still has his uh, 1971 uh, Gibson Les Paul Deluxe. Ooh. And he says, there's a guitar right there. It's not, a, it's not a, just a straight guitar. It's a Gibson Les Paul. Yeah, so yeah. if you want to learn, there's a guitar right there. Yeah. I got a bunch of basses. It's like the Cadillac of guitars. Kind of. I got a bunch of basses, two Rickenbackers, uh, one Fender mm. uh, Jazz jazz bass Reckenbachers and, make pretty good bass uh, bass guitars as well yeah and uh, I got a DX7 on the uh, yeah, it was Yamaha right mm. uh, piano keyboard this and that and he says no I want to play drums so he started going to uh, drum lessons I was a little boy so my mom took my brother to that drum lessons and she doesn't know how to how what to do with me so she led me there too oh she left you there yes but well, she took him along for the ride right so that probably changed your life so i was that this this drum teacher was a, a, a friend of my father so i was we i we we get into the first lesson of my brother and they start um uh, Imagine of John Lennon. So it's a real British, simple pattern. Real simple pattern. And it's a, I got to say, it's my, the first song I learned. You've ever learned. But um, my brother starts drumming and I says, okay, I mean, it's all right. So he learned it and he got back into home and there was a CB 700 <laughs> drum kit with no heads on the bottoms. And, and my brother, my, my dad came from work and says, hey, dad, look, this, look at this. So he, he did the song. And next week, he went again to the, the drum lessons. So he got into another song. Now, were you there present with him? Yes. Okay, so you were like, fuck it, I'm going with you. Well, my right. I, I, oh, I because your mom would just leave no you there. Choice. There you go. <laughs> and right, right, a, right. It, okay, you staying with your brother. Exactly. Uh, and whatever. Yeah. Go f fuck around. I mean, you, you want to stay here or you want to go with me? <laughs> Hell to, no, because you're going to go do your nails and toes. I'm not fucking with that. Right. Drink a coffee <laughs> with some of her friends. Right, yeah. A lot of mierda. Uh -huh. Kind of. <laughs> so I said, Hell no, I'll stay here. Yeah. And... uh he got into a part and I said, and I turned and it says, that's not the way it goes. <laughs> oh, no shit. And he said, shut up. You're not, I mean, you don't even know how to drum. You're so. a bystander. You're in the peanut gallery. I don't know. I don't know, but that's not the way it goes. That riff is not like that. And how old were you at this time? I was almost 13. But you knew what you heard wasn't what the way the pattern was. Exactly. Right. And, uh, but the, the drum teacher didn't say anything. So until next week, he didn't did that song. So they practiced the same song next week. And he started and he get back into that part. And I said, bro, that's not the way it goes. I mean, I was like pissed yeah. off. You were adamant about it. So he got mad at me. He says, shut up. You're not the one who's taking Teaching the lesson. Teaching me. me. Yeah. You, you know? So the teacher, Adolfo, he's still alive. Thanks to him. Um, he looked at me and said, Adrian, do you know how it goes? I said, yeah. So it was, his drum lessons was with two drum kits looking. At each other? At each other. Facing each facing other. Each other. Facing, facing each other, yes. He was, he used, he, he was, it was a Tama for the, 
drum lessons and he used he used to have a a big old white Ludwig uh, kit. Hey man, which uh, real quick, uh, which is better, Tama or Ludwig? <laughs> It's like it's all, a, it's it's all like, preference. It's not like Ibanez and Jackson. Doesn't yeah. matter. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Follow uh, having a stupid Stratocaster question. or a Telecaster. Stupid or, question. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> and he asked me, "Do you know how it goes?" I said, "Yes." Oh, really? So he show gi- me. He give me the drumsticks. So I stand up as soon as I can, and I where in my bus is there, not here. And you're not taking my seat. Exactly. You're not taking my seat. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, fuck it. And I get into spra tu po 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 boom psh until one, bro. Woo. You're not on you're not on four. It's until one. One tu po tu po tu one. Woo. Right. So the Adolfo, this teacher, he says, Oh wow. So Adrian, you know the song from the beginning? I said, Yes. Okay. It was it was cassette, so he rewinded and says, "There you go, play to it now." It's <laughs> so mob. So the drum, the the lesson uh, got to finished, and my mom came by, and she said, "My mom, she's called Adriana, just like me." She thought I was a girl. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so she called me Adrian. Uh, she said they were huge friends, you know? She said, Adriana, uh, Tavo, he's not the drummer. Adrian is the drummer. Wow. And she said, what? Um, I mean, he's not the, taking, he's not the one taking lessons? She, he said, yes, but he's, he's the, the one. He's, he's the natural drummer. He's the one who did it. And... And so we got, we were, that was, back home was like chaos. It was just, kinda, like, I, I, I want to get into it. Kind of chaos. I want to, well, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break, but I want to get into that chaos before we break. <laughs> because that's got to be heartbreaking for your older brother. Kind of. I was, mean, was, yes, was, but I no. mean, was he, was, was he passionate about it? I mean, being hurt from pride is one thing. But if he was passionate about it, that would have been devastating. How did he take it? He didn't take it that bad huh. because he was, he, he, I mean, he, you can tell he was into music. You know, he's mm-hmm. still into music. Mm-hmm. He's a bass player, just, my, just like my dad. Right. He was just trying to figure out where he would fit in as far exactly. as instruments. So he, 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 it wasn't, he wasn't devastated, No, but I'm sure. So what was the turmoil with your dad back at home? My, first of all, we get into the, into the car and my mom says, what happened? What happened here? Ah. So yeah, I was pissed. Oh, but, uh, Adrian, he just, uh, upstaged me. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on talking during the lesson and he's telling me that he is not the way it goes and this and that. So the drum teacher told him how he, he got set on it and then he showed me how it, and it, the the worst of all that he's, he did it just getting sit on the drum set, you know, it, the first yeah. take. First take, he got it right. And, One uh, take Willie, man. And 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 mom she looks at me at the mirror. I can remember that. Damn, bro. She let me say, You did it? And I said, Yes, mom. I did it. Yeah. I could never get up on the drum kit on my home because it was his. Right. So that's why boom. God, he always appears. Hey, what you doing in my drum kit? Uh, says, Bro, I'm just trying to. No, 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 no. You're going to break my sticks. You're going to. Uh, so you my... had limited experience on the drum set because your brother would be like, hey, kick rocks. Kind of. I was... but, it, but it became, it came natural to you. He's the baby. It, 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 it came natural to you. The rhythms, the percussion, the, the, the structure. It came natural to you. It did. So that come back from work late at night and. And we were having dinner, and we, uh, we, I mean, the conversation came out. Right, you had to talk about it. Um, uh, Rosendo, you know that uh, I take the Gustavo to the drum lesson, and the problem that I came back, and, and Adrian was the one who was drumming. It's just like that. Oh, really? And what do you did? 
I just I just told Tavo that the riff it wasn't like that. That I mean, I'm sorry. I just I yeah. was he was he need to get one hit more to get to the correct pattern to the one right. I mean, to, uh, yeah, he had he had a complete <laughs> he had a complete the perfect loop exactly. Right. I don't know the tone, but it was like that patuco go mm. right there. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you do it again? I said yes. He says he 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 turned to my brother and says, "Tavo, you got the song." Says, yeah, yeah, I got the song. <laughs> He's reluctant. He's like, "Man, I don't hey, dog, I don't want to fucking play this. You go up, show me again." <laughs> so in front of daddy. Yeah. So my dad said, "He's like, he's all right. He's all right." And my dad said, "Okay, it's early. Let's uh, let's let's plug in. You want to? Do you want to sit down?" I said, "Yes." Hell yeah. Okay. So he he put the song and and it was uh, he he put the song and and my dad is was like mm, okay he could pick up this bass and he got the song you know fast it was three chords song. and bass and drums are like peanut butter Bro, and jelly his dad is not just like his dad just didn't go he didn't just play at the bar and down the oh, fucking no, street no 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 yeah yeah I his can imagine. dad. When that was like another thing that I was like, I don't know who you are, dude. Who are you? Like his he shows me his dad. He's like, oh yeah, my dad's so and so, and he's never he never boasted about it before. Oh yeah, you know X X song, and I was like, um, yeah, I think I've heard of. It. Oh yeah, my dad, that's my dad. Shit. And I was like, what? I'm like, dude, this guy has like lineage. Nineteen seventy first Mexican band to hit. Number one hit on Billboard in the U.S. Woo! I think the term is pedigree. Thank you. Yes, there you go. Good one. So, uh, okay, we got into it. So, 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 you know what? You know how to drums. You know how to drum. So, what was the other? Hey, Dad. You know what? <laughs> With the Gustavo, he did the uh, uh, this Imagine song from John Lennon. Oh, really? Yes. So he took off his bass and gave it to my brother and says, it's here. It's right here and here. And these are the chords. It's, it's, it's easy. Can you do it? So my brother got into the bass and... Tum, tum, tum. and hey. chica, chico, brazo, so now... Go, 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 go. Imagine all... The, the people. people, that's the song, that's the band, that's the way you gotta be there on the bass drum and you gotta be there on the drum kit. It's it okay? Hey man, that's so be- both. Me, so that's both beautiful. Like, yeah, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful because your dad had the foresight to say, okay, this is not gonna be an issue. You're gonna be on drums. Come here. Mm-hmm. Here's the bass, and he gives him another gift. Yes, and that gift becomes something—an instrument that he's playing for the and rest of his life. That's what he's doing now. And it, what happened after that? Because that's so beautiful, man. After that, a week, a week after that, or two weeks after that, my brother came back and says, "Hey, I got a band, and we're we're gonna be on a contest, or you can you call that it's a, a battle, battle of the bands, the battle of the bands, right?" And my dad. And we got to do this song. So my brother put the CD, I don't remember. And it starts with a... So it was not just, just not, not just the line. It was the tempo was, yeah. you know, was tricky. Yeah. I wanted, I need to learn that song, that. Because I'm, I'm yeah. we're, we're doing that thing. So my dad says, "Okay, if you if you want to, I mean, let's work it out." Yeah. If you do it, I mean, cool. If you're not, and he learned it fast. He did. He this got was, it. This was your brother on the bass. Yes, he got it fast. So, so that was dad, his instrument, man. Yes, he's still his instrument. Now he's he's singing and talk, playing guitar oh, and con- singing country in Monterey, Mexico, yes. but. He's a bass player, like like native bass player. He wasn't on the drums. He he always get into the drums wow. and play the same riff and laugh after that. Wow. He do always that riff, that 
That's beautiful, man. He still does the same thing. He does. He still <laughs> does the same thing. Wow. He just every we were on a we were on a party or whatever. He got it. It's, it's all quiet. He always do that. He's all quiet, and he got into the he he, he sits on the drum kit. He push the harder he can, and he stands up. That's all I know from drums. Wow. Is. So it's a beautiful thing that your dad was able to articulate and see that you were the drummer. He was the basis. Kudos once again on your dad for being able to visualize that and see, okay, cool. This is not going to be a big issue. One is good at one thing. The other one has the musical talent to be able to pick up basic notes, and he's going to build on that. So from there, tell us how you, you, you know, tell us your next adventure with drumming and, and give us a story. I got into... Quickly, I can I can do it as possible. I I I search for a bass player and a, some guitar player and and start a band. So did did your brother ever pop up into the the your mind as him being part of the band, or you was like, no, he's got his own band. I am not gonna mess with what he's doing. Is yeah, that, we we I mean, he's four years older than me, so. You, you felt like you guys weren't going to relate because of the age difference. I mean, at that at that time, at that age, I mean, it it was a difference. Right now, you know, you're like, I mean, it's okay, but on that age, he was already in in qué es después de secundaria la preparatoria cómo le dicen acá. Like he was already kind of like in university and college and stuff. Oh, I got you. Yeah, so man. Yeah, he was yeah. with different. Yeah, the, the age difference that that definitely made a yeah. Made an impact. I was right. still in junior high, so right. in high school, so right. Uh, and uh, so he started doing his thing, and I start doing my thing, and and we were talking about it uh, a few moments ago that I I never found someone who can sing what I want to. The, the the songs that I want to do they didn't put the emotion into it right yeah and and they were like everyone was all into the the famous or the mainstream songs and this and that and I always been like the B sides or mm -hmm. the I the, love B sides I love B sides I love yeah. B sides yeah. and uh, it, I I've been in through the years like I mean okay that song is cool but it's not the best song of the album, you know? I mean, I've been in a lot of, like that, in cases like that. It's, it's, it's a great song, but it's not the best song of the mm, album. Right. My, 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 kind, my vision. So uh, I got into, I, I, we got together with some friends and we started to, to rock in some Green Day songs and Pro Jam and Soul Garden and, and Candlebox. Oh, I remember Candlebox. Well, yes. the yeah. Collective Soul. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a beautiful riff, too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we start doing all that, and, and then uh, I was, I can't remember what year, but they invited me to do this, uh, this regional Mexican uh, style of music, you know, with accordion and bajo sexto. I gotta be honest, it was, I think it was 94, 90, late 94, early 95 that we started that. And on 96, I did my first album. So, so we, I, we got like into professional with a label company and a management and a booking agent. Let, let's, re, let's rewind real quick because you're giving us a lot. And I, I, <laughs> I mean, do the time I know, but, but. What was the major difference that you found as far as being a drummer from playing hard rock songs or what at the time would be considered grunge? What was the big difference and, and how did you have to adapt from that type of style to all of a sudden playing uh, these uh, a different type of music like corridos? And, mm -hmm. and I mean, because it's different. It's different music. The patterns are different. Was that difficult for you to, you know, fall in line to and 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 and, ex and, and get, you know play it? It's still honestly, it's a st it's still it's a still difficult because. It's, Do you find it more difficult? No, just the thing that you need to make it sound. It's not just that you learn to play it. You know, you need to make it sound how it goes. 
I mean, you got the riff. Yes, no, but it's... You know, you get to give that. You have to give it it's certain bravados. Right. Yes, so mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's it still being difficult, always changing or or that new boundaries or new... I don't know what, how you... What did you enjoy or what do you enjoy more? Like playing corridos or, or, or playing like original hard rock patterns? Everything is lovely. The only difference is that professionally, I haven't felt that emotion being on stage playing hard rock. You know, it's... It's, it's a different... You think the emotion is better with hard rock? It should be. I mean, I, I don't know. I I can tell how it feels, but... I'm I'm totally sure that it's way different. Different you know? emotion. The vibe. I mean, just just right now, being playing Mexican music here in the U.S. and go back to Mexico and play it the same songs. Yeah. It's way different. It's like play yeah. here. It's like play here some of the rock and roll and go to New York or go to Miami and play the same set list. It's it's a different vibe, you know. Is it because of how the audience yes. digests it? Yes. And then gives you the energy back? Totally, yes. Now, tell us about your first experience actually recording your very first song. Tell us about that experience in the studio. Oh, wow. They put me that bone that clicks on my ears that kick, kick, kick. Is this. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? Every drummer's like nightmares first. You like need to follow that. I said, what? Yes. That's the tempo of the song. So and click, I, click, and I, click. And how old were you when you went into the studio to record your first song? I was 15 years old. I know. I mean, I know that you got to... That is that you are very young. The first time I ever stepped into the studio, I was 18 years old. Oh, wow. And for you to be 15 and to be recording of uh, your very first song, number one... Maturity is a huge factor, but most importantly, word, worldly knowledge of the musical experience is a huge factor. And for you to be able to step into a recording studio with, how old were the musicians that you were playing with for your first song? They were like two or three years older than me. And for you to be that young, you, you kind of remind me of a Rick Allen. Rick Allen from Def Leppard was much younger from the original you know, guys in the band. Was this album? No. No? No. It was another one, no? I mean, yes. Yes, yes, yes. We did with that. That's the first real album that we did. Commercial album. Yeah, for the, for the record label. For the label. record label. But we did, a, we did our album two years before that. Okay. Now, now, going back to your first song, you're in the studio for the first song. This is the the band you were playing with for a while, right? Yes, 10 years. Okay. Oh, wow, 10 years, right? First time you guys recorded the, your first song. Mm -hmm. So obviously, there was no issues with like, oh, he's a young kid. A pattern of how well you knew how to play was already been established. Everyone had trust in you. This guy's good to go. No issues. Okay, so tell us about that experience. You're recording. Were you nervous? You tell us all the emotions you felt walking into a professional studio to record for the very first time at a young 15 years of age with limited worldly experience. <laughs> How was that? No, man, because to me, that's when I fell in love with recording, recording, not ne just necessarily music, but going into a studio and the smell, the aroma, the, oh, wow. the, um, the ambiance, the feeling, the nervousness, the money's on the line, you got to get things right, and you hope you, you put enough prep time into not wasting money, and oh my goodness, you get goosebumps, and you see the, the knobs of the mixer, and you're like, holy shit, you, you feel like you want to have an orgasm right there, like a lot of people listening to this podcast aren't going to understand, but we're musicians, and it's almost like I would assume a crack addict looking at the crack pipe, and you just want a nut right there, you know? <laughs> You know, it, it, you, you automatically fall in love with it, but you don't know what the hell you're stepping into the very first time. So tell us about that experience. Uh, it was, I mean, the final process of everything was great. But to be honest, uh, I... I, I, love, I love this engineer, uh, Ramon Daniel Garza. 
whatever you are, I mean, he's in Monterey. Kevin, his son, I love them. And and since then, they he teach me, or he he didn't know the lesson he gave to me. But I'm a curious guy that I I bought new hats for my drum kit. It was a black export series pearl, and uh, I got into the studio and I says I got my drum kit. And he says, oh, you want to record with your drums? I said, yes. You just bought them, yeah. Uh, this is, yeah. This is, this is, I know how it sounds. Right. This is, I feel comfortable on it, so hmm. yes. Oh, wow. Because on this kid, just Salomón Robles, they just did a Por Favor No Me Compares album. So, so they uh, already had a drum kit already set up in the recording studio yes. where a professional drummer... Yes. Had just recorded what you would consider a hit mm -hmm. on that kit, and it you was it was a hit on that yeah. moment. And then you wanted to come through with your own per personal kit, and he was like, "Hold on, okay, so what happened?" And I said, "I mean, I don't care at all if he he, he, he Ringo Starr record here, right? I got my drum kit, and I want to record with my things. Balls, balls. Oh wow, balls. hey, Padilla." Uh, you need to keep your kids. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a guy. He thinks he's the fucking gift of the world already. Huh? He's only 15 years old. Kind of. That's the that's the feedback that I wanted to hear. <laughs> were the personal challenges that you had to go through where people looking down at you like, hey, we know what we're doing, young boy. Okay, you pause. listen to us. I can explain. I'm a Mexican and I can explain in, in English the perfect sentences or the perfect words that I need to do but you're helping me out thank right. you right yeah okay so I set it up and they put the, we said we did the setup with the mics and everything on your on your drum set on my drum set okay. yes okay so are you ready yes click 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 this is what's this this is this your this is your tempo they they told me I mean I used to practice with the metronome. I, I know what was, what it was. It's not that, I'm not saying that I didn't never heard of it before. But we got into the studio and I never thought about it, that I would record on top of it on tempo. So they put me a click. I was pretty nervous. And I, I start getting lost. And then I start asking more volume for the click more volume for the more and more and and did did you have a pair of headphones on while yes, you were recording yes. right yes but it was that loud the drums were that loud no the click the metronome on my here on my on your headphones. headphones it was so loud that it was getting into the microphones of my kit oh that's so, not good exactly so Could you explain that, how that creates a difficult issue with recording? It's because on the recording, it will be the click on the song. Do you, do, uh, I hope you guys understand what he's saying. He's saying that the volume was so loud on his headphones that it was being picked up on the microphones that were there only to record his percussions. Right, yes. It was so <laughs> loud that it would bleed over into the actual recording and you would be able to hear the click. The click. So I pushed my phone, my headphones to my head, to my to my ears, and I said, "Does it, does it mute a little bit?" I mean, so right? It, does it help mute it? Yeah. Yes, and they told me yes. So I pick up a, a duct tape and you wrap it around the headphones, it around. almost like you had a toothache. <laughs> <laughs> and then to we, damper the sound from the headphones coming out. Yes, we start we start recording that day. Everything was kind of it wasn't just me we were seven six musicians and the singer so we were six doing music and and it was not doing it that okay hmm. but we before that we were practice we were doing that songs that those 12 songs for almost 10 months so everything was like kind of perfect it was yeah damn near concrete but we were Pretty nervous being in the studio. Right. So Ramon Daniel Garza again said, uh, he, 
he brought us on the control room and told us, hey, this is not a joke, guys. I mean, we're going to keep on doing this until today. It's right. Until it's right. If today this first song don't come out like you guys or like it should supposed to sound, you're going to get back to the drawing board to the practice room and do it all over all over when all over again and when you're ready you will then be you back in the back. studio right wow. so and like i said it's no joke man it's just yeah, crazy no, yeah, yeah yeah and i said pause first of all i searched for the money for this recording mm. the youngest boy in the band look up for the money for got into the studio Wow. So I said, hey, 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 hey. we're going to do it if you want it or not. Mm. It's not it's not your option. I'm paying this, you know? Perfect. I searched for the money for this. It's like uh, $700 Ooh. now. Wow. How, how, many, how many hours? 10,000 pesos back in the day. How many Man, hours? How, that seven, right seven, there. $700. How many hours of recording studio would that give you? Mm, mm, it... Mm, didn't matter. They just want it would just complete one song. No, no. the the I'm, twelve songs on a week. Oh wow! They give us like we were doing it in the middle of the night and with some help. Right. You know? Okay, I will help you out. We do it in the middle of the night that nobody knows. That, that, that'll cut back on the cost. Exactly. Right. So, so I said, hell no. Yeah. We're yeah. doing this. We're doing. We we are gonna do this recording. If you like it or not, I'm paying. Right. I mean, we're, we have to be satisfied. You don't have to be satisfied. You're just getting paid for a service. You're like a taxi driver. <laughs> you get us from A to B. Whether we're, we're whether we all we want to know is okay. Did you get us to to B? You got it to you got us to where we gotta go. Okay, cool. Doesn't matter if uh, you gave us hors d'oeuvres on the way there. I don't give a damn. Exactly. So mm-hmm. uh, we did. We, I mean, we like concentrate and and trying to do our best, and we did our first album there. And uh, I still listening to it, and I said, "What did I did?" But I was fifteen years old, you know. Do Do you listen to the album now and say to yourself, "Wow, I could have done a better job"? Of course, yeah, yeah. Well, of now, course. when when the product was done, when the album was done, and the engineer or the producer. No was he was he was he was he not he was he satisfied with yeah, the yeah, final yeah. product? Was he yeah, satisfied? Yeah, yeah. He just I mean the talking about the drum kit he he was just lazy honestly he was just there's a drum kit here you uh, play record and we're done you know we start oh, we start the recording right now if you want to set up your drum kit we're gonna start like. In, but your time time is money. We're, Fire, we're, we're we're sorting now, like we're recording. Exactly. So right. it was all like kind of lazy thing, but it was like a Adrian hell of a drums, and <laughs> Adrian. That's why that's I always on the podcast when we're talking about music. I always say to individuals, <clears throat> listen, when you go to a recorder studio, your prep work has to happen before. Like we we stepped outside for a break. And JJ and I and Mikey, we did a track. We went, I, I did the the basic skeleton here. We went to the recording studio and I said, hey, look, okay, uh, part of it is, the major part is done. And then he goes, okay, you guys good? And I was like, no, man, no, 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 no. I got another riff I have in my head. I didn't know how to do the time signature on, a, on my home recording studio because it's all digital i don't know how to do the time signature difference yeah i said can we do it here he goes yeah we can do it here so we did it and um he was willing to just say okay man you guys are good but it 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 goes to the point that you just made if you're not satisfied with the money that you earn if you go to a studio and you walk out and you're not satisfied with it it's your fault it is as an artist because you, look the the guy behind the board all he does is press record he'll do a little bit he'll wet it up here or there you as an artist have to know your capabilities and if you could do it better then you say we're going to do another take and if he tells you no that's good you tell him no man 
it's good for you because you want me out of here. You have another rack coming in another two hours, but it's not good for me. I'm not going to be satisfied. So we're going to do it again. And that what that is a, what you're supposed to do if you want to be satisfied and walking out of the studio with a good project. Yes, totally. I mean, first of all, you got to at least have heard anything of that studio before. I mean, just like a recommendation. If you got into a studio, it's because you heard a friend of yours or some sort of band, a local band or a big band, you never know, that came out from that studio, came out from that engineer and came out from that room, you know? So it's it's not easy but when you're starting it's not it's not easy you got to do your thing your own thing at least with your tools to at least show say we we'll say a, a label manager or a, a, a promoter or some uh, radio person or something like that 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 you can show him something that you want to do like, give him give him a feel give him know, an idea and to, to interject a little bit uh -huh. um my compadre also he was a uh, artist relations for um for sony or for universal, universal for universal yes he did that for a couple of years what what did that job entail adrian it's, it's an a and r they call them it's arts oh. and it's arts arts and repertory okay well so what's your job when you when you do that position you build up not musically you build up an album from from bottom to top everything even though things that you never thought about it so uh, we're looking at like maybe the the the, the, the tempo of the song the confirmation of the publishing in the song, uh, the composer the, of the song, the copyrights, the copyrights. If he already signed the song mm. for some publishing, mm. the master song, mm. the master mix of mm. the song, parts, Pro Tools parts. Now you right. don't have that right. old two, uh, was it two inches? Mm -hmm. That the reels, the real reel to reels. Yeah. Um, now, and uh, it, it, it would go as far as the album artwork, right? The cover, everything, everything, artwork wow. inside, outside, uh, barcode. The, oh yeah, for sales. Oh, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. That is a lot of work. Now, let me ask you something. How, in your personal opinion, do you think it's more effective for an artist? <clears throat> okay, let's let's. I'll ask this question from my point of view. Okay, so I record music here in my personal studio. It sounds good, but it's I'm I have to master it, or let's say I have to mix it then master it. Mm -hmm. Would you feel it's more effective for me to outsource or have somebody else out of my own personal studio to mix it? or for me to mix it myself and then send it out for mastering. What are your personal views on it? Because the reason why I'm asking you this is, and then we'll go into production later on, but when I mix my music, I want it to sound a, a, a certain way. If I give it to someone else, it's going to sound different from what my visualization is, right? And then sometimes I'll say, okay, well, I'm just going to mix it here and they'll give it to someone else to master it. And when mm. they master it, it still comes out different. So it what does. is your what is your opinion on that? It does. Uh, first, I mean, first of all, you got to know. And can you explain, before you even explain that, can you explain what is mastering? The easy way to explain to the public <laughs> is, have you heard an album that you... Turn on the volume loud and still sounds good. Mm -hmm. And some albums that you put at the same volume and it sounds horrible. Distorted. That's a master. Mm -hmm. That's a mastering well done. Mm -hmm. When some when in when an album you turn it like you you crank boom, it to ten. Your mm -hmm. your boombox mm -hmm. give to ten, you put it on ten mm -hmm. and it sounds great at your party and then next song. You love the song, mm. but it sounds horrible. 
So it's 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 keeping the con uh, keeping the sound at the same quality, yes. quality and level. The musically they 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 say they cut the cortan los picos. You cut down the peaks. The peaks. So it doesn't click. You clip. Exactly. Yeah. You, you cut. Doesn't the, distort. Yeah. That's that's the first thing you do on a mastering. Mm -hmm. But you just said it. It's it's yeah. not easy that you have something in mind and then you give it to someone else mm -hmm. and then they give you back the so the let me is let like, me give you an example. I didn't right? want to yeah, sound so like no, no, perfect. So what when I record here, whether it's production, let's say I do production vocals here mm -hmm. in my personal studio, I, I make sure it, it's not peaking, whether it's the vocal. And then, ladies and gentlemen, then what happens is when you have instruments and then vocals, it's a totality of of noise. All together, they can peak. You can mute the instrumental. The vocals won't peak. You put the music in, it's going to peak. So it's a totality of noise. So you, as a individual mixing your own music, you do not want any peaks. So then when you hand that project, and it could be a total of 12 to 7 to 4 songs, you hand that over to another individual to master it, he's going to put his magic into it, and they all have to sound equal. And if, like Jake... JJ says it could be at two, volume two, excuse me. And once you crank it at 10, like Adrian said, it still has to sound the same as crisp without distortion, mm -hmm. like it was at two. Exactly. Right? It's weird because uh, sometimes you, you, you start an idea with production and, and it says, okay, it's going to sound, this part has got to be. A little bit louder the riff because it's fast, so I can do it that louder. No, so you can manage that thing on the studio, but you give it to someone else that you don't know, mm. and he doesn't know what you're do you're, you're doing if you're, you're what your idea is, right? right. What your type of music is, right? But being he and Cali, I mean, there's a lot of incredible, great music that has come out from this state that you can finish hooking up with someone that can do that. Give for, you the, the finishing touches. Can can help you out for at least, and I don't know, I don't want to say, I don't want to say specific numbers, but cheap numbers mm. for a specific song or for a specific album or mm. an EPK or a demo mm. or this and that. So always, always on... On every gig or in every practice, if someone showed up, you don't know who this person is, mm. and it and it it gets to you and talk to you about anything. You need to pay attention, even you, even though you're picking up your things because you want to get back home as soon as possible because you're tired. You got to pay attention. Everything was going on around you because you never know. Who are you gonna be talking with, and what can help you out? I agree, Adrian. How when you when you go into a recording studio, or let's say not even that, let's say you're around the band. Are you a songwriter? I have a few songs. Okay, very few, but I do. I do Now, write. when you're creating a song and you're doing it, do you have you have you created a song by yourself? Or amongst your band members, both, both, um, yes. It, do you find it more difficult to create a song, or write a song with band members than by yourself? It's always helpful, but sometimes you want to talk about uh, the the street out of your house, and you start writing there. And if you're with the band members. Whenever you notice, you're on the freeway now. Mm. You're not on the street. It's not, oh, yes, because you get to the light and you turn left and now you get to the 15th freeway. And this, No, 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 no. I I'm, I'm still want to talk about the street. Don't rush. Or, I've been... So I, I understand. I've been... When I ever I, I write a song, I've been very guarded. I don't let any... When I write a song, it's me from start to finish. Okay. Because to me, it's a personal journey, Right. 
and anybody, well, first of all, I've never been in a situation where everyone, anyone else has been in a room with me to help me out. Okay. So I've always been very introverted. So it's got to be my letter from the beginning to the end. Yes. Because it's my letter, my personal letter from me, from my heart to the world. <clears throat> So I watch a documentary with Metallica, and now Metallica as a group starts to write a song together, mm -hmm. and then they're now like, man, well, what words should we use here for this particular yeah, verbiage? They do, it, they do it backwards. Right. They do it collectively, and I say to myself, well, I don't I don't know. I, I, I This is my personal opinion, because that's just the way I've always worked. I'm like, you know, maybe the letter should come from... But I think it has to do with... Um, I think we talked about this, compadre, where... where, where when you're i mean in the i mean the art is the passion but to commercialize it and to monetize it there has to be some type of um you know you have to treat it as a business so thank you thank you thank you and i think we've talked about this because we always have these discussions about what because it's always subjective subjective about What's good and what's good to me is not good for somebody else or, or you're, whatnot. JJ, and you're absolutely right. And, and, and I don't mean to cut you off, but if I don't, I'm going to forget what I wanted to say. Adrian, before we started recording, I said to you, the reason why I would consider myself a novice right, or somebody who's, uh, who does it on a part-time is because I only write when I'm inspired and it gives me the most potentest emotion or what i would consider my best and what makes a professional a professional is the professional will write whenever at the drop of a dime he will sit down and write and then what i that's what i consider an individual who is a novice who is only he writes when he's inspired and an individual who is a professional will write down and say look we have to bills have to get paid we're gonna write It almost reminds me of a skit from uh, In Living Color. When old girl was like, you know, with her acoustic guitar, uh, damn, I got two hours to write this song. You drive a fast car, your ass think, and I don't give a fuck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I mean. But but when I said that, you kind, of, you kind of like looked at me like awkwardly. Like, do you agree that a professional writes at the drop of a dime and finds inspiration or he waits until inspiration hits me? Or what, what, what What's your, your, your topic on that? What are your thoughts? Best songs always come out from being inspired not because bills got to get paid because you're forcing it exactly every it's it's the the uh, i mean it's it's been once and again with a lot of bands that they got into being inspired being recording being inspired being recording two albums and then the third album the label company starts like hey we need to do a little bit of something you know because if not this is the last album for yours for your band and if nothing happens bye bye right we're gonna so, cut you off the label so you need to start to do something and then they start to write shit of songs just because Someone else told them that for August, a new album got to be out and you have nothing. They're forced. I, yes. You know, that, that would be something to touch on um, that people don't understand about the businesses that, that there are deadlines, right, compadre? On some instances, there is like, hey, August, you need to have something out, um, because of x reason you know mm -hmm. and people i don't think people don't understand yeah. that and some cases where some to keep the fan if you're on a deal active. for like a three album can you can you just kind of briefly touch uh, about say somebody say i have a three album deal and i have to is is when they have to deliver they have to deliver in a certain time frame on oh, special band yeah hugh lewis in the news Mod Lang, we come back again with the Robert Mod Lang. It was it, Hugh Lewis in the news. Yes, and they did three albums, and then they have a, a, a I think a four contract deal, and they say, you know what, you did three albums, and okay, you know you're just 
going through and nothing's big happening. So you know what? This four album, this fourth album, we're not gonna do it. Ah. So Robert Mott Lang. Lang came by and says, No, no, wait a second. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this album with these guys, and then we talk about it. Hmm. And the magic happens. And power of love and yes, everything came yes. out after that. Yes. Okay. Adrian, how important is it for an artist to have a producer? He doesn't do the song. He just he just mixed perfectly the ingredients to do the song a great song. Could you say, compadre, that the producer preserves the idea that the artist has sometimes he he does it way better from right the, from okay. the i don't i can't remember now the the garbage drummer he's never mind nirvana's producer oh i thought you were talking about me dog shit <laughs> nah jj come on dog. <laughs> jj no, la, come on. Buddy, la, you, you, you knew that way before that we got here buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can't remember his name. He's 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 Nirvana's Nevermind producer. This is a band called Garbage, right? Okay, I know about of Garbage. Oh, oh, I'll get you yeah, right there. Right. He listened to the Nirvana Garbage mm -hmm. cassette, and it was like. <laughs> so they got together. And that story is on the VH1 classic albums. Mm. You will see that. Right. He says, no, we are going to do it a clean. We're going to start with a clean version of that riff on the song. And he says, so, so the band creates the songs. He just has a different interpretation of the sound. That's right. Uh, Where it goes how it goes, and how it's going to sound. Do you think, or would you ever give a producer that type of liberty to be like, hey, man, this guy, this producer is the fucking greatest. He's you know, going to give, we're going to give him the liberty to, to pro executive produce the whole album. Have you ever been in that situation? Not me, but you I know? have heard of, 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 of albums like, like uh, Let It Be of Beatles that... Mm. They did it by themselves, and then they send it to uh, Phil Spector to do it. And I, he just—I was just—I was just gonna say Phil Spector, right? Phil Spector, or okay. this, um, I remember now, mm. thanks to Google, Butch Big. Ah, oh. it's Garbage Drummer. Mm -hmm. He's Nirvana's Nevermind producer. Mm -hmm. So he made it sounds. He says, "You know, Kurt, you sings." Kind of weird, crazy. Right. So we're gonna double your voice. We're gonna put it in until onto two channels, and we're gonna to double it up. You know what? Yeah, the bass player. It made it sound more powerful. Of course. Of course. Same thing with Metallica's Black Album uh, with. Uh, uh, Absolutely, and and there's all tricks of the trade, JJ. You know when you double up and then you grab one track, and one track goes left, one track goes right, so it sounds. And I'm still learning because my we were just talking about this. Remember we were talking about snare sound? Okay, yeah, yeah. And and I was just like, hey, I'm trying to like, I can't get, I I don't understand why I can't get the snare sound. And he says, well, you're never gonna get it. Hell no. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? He's like, it's impossible. And I was like, what are you talking about? Right. I already did not, this. Right. I did that. Right. He says, you don't understand. He goes, the process that what you're listening to, what for for the where the Sarasnan that you actually are listening to, what it went through from where it came from. And he goes, and that's why you'll oh. never replicate that sound he goes so ju just stop right there that's where you're wrong to begin with oh, he goes you'll never shit. replicate that that never. just made so much sense right there never. and i'm i i must have spent i must have spent like easily like two months working oh, and i'm like what's wrong with my shit. ear there's something wrong with my ear and he's like no he goes you're just you're wrong to you're wrong to start with because you'll never gonna and, replicate and you, know, and you that. know what that that just goes to show you adrian's experience 
Happened, yes. happened to me with Frizzly Fry of Primus. Back in the 90s, uh, all the drummers, they should know, or most of them, they know, the piccolo drums, piccolo snares were the, were the thing. So Team Herb Alexander record, uh, did a uh, uh, suck on this, he did Frizzly Fry, he did Sailing in the Seas of Cheese with piccolo snares. And back in the days, I used to have a, an old snare drum, huge drums. He looks like a floor tom. And I never never got into that sound. And I always told my dad, Dad, is, I can't get that sound because he's using a piccolo snare and, and I'm using this big snare. So I start working, doing some gigs in a school and then on a prom thing and this and that so i earned the money to do to buy me a piccolo snare oh so i bought my first piccolo snare and surprise i didn't get didn't the, get this exact I didn't sound get, i didn't get the you sound bought the too. piccolo snare thinking that you were gonna get <laughs> he the exact still sound. Wasn't, he still didn't get it and i t- and he still didn't get it so i said what the hell? What the hell? From that moment to now, I'm going to give a big goal here. Um, he, he used to play pork pies hmm. that moment. And I, used, and I said, I need a pork pie. So I bought my first pork pie and it sounds great, but I never get the sound. Pork pie, is that a, another piece um, of percussion? It's a, drum, it's a brand. It's a brand of, of drum sets or drum, oh, okay. it's a, oh, so, uh, drum okay. company. Okay. So it sounds great, but I never get that sound until I first time I get to the studio and I record my first song and finished. And I leave my drum, ski, my, my drum sticks and says, what do you did? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? That was the sound I was looking for the whole time, and I bought all these different equipments. And I got into the control room and listening to it, and says, "Oh, okay, that's not my snare drum. This sounds great." Because he was what we would call wetting it up, process, right? Until a, on 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 an equalizer and a compressor and then to a preamp and then a little bit maybe a little bit of reverb and uh, yeah, exactly or mm-hmm. some uh, a little bit of delay or yep some, all know? kinds of stuff yeah and the then it's stuff. just like oh my god this sounds great that's why the sound will never be the same ladies and gentlemen let me try to uh explain what adrian just the <laughs> great drummer adrian just said is that it's hard to replicate a sound when it's been introduced into a studio because the individual behind the mixing board adds these different effects to a percussion a guitar a vocal and those different effects are no longer the original sound exactly so in order if you think you're going to get an original sound uh good luck to you You save yourself some time right yes (laughs) you might have to go to the engineer and be like or the producer like yo man what what settings and not even the settings but what particular hardware or software were you using and then what settings what level did you put it at you watch a video or you watch a live album or whatever and you see oh my god he got that drum head on the bass drum and that uh the drum pedal and he's doing it with the this kind of beater these oh, sticks i gotta get those sticks i gotta get those right. I gotta get that's those gonna change my sound i get the magic oh, pick hey the magic I, pick the, brother, the magic pick hey, of brother, destiny right? honestly honestly you get to have mod lang behind you yes doing that's true putting putting together with the engineer telling telling the engineer you know what we're gonna we this is the riff. First of all, guys, this riff, it goes all the song. Mm. Okay? This is my hook, guys, if you don't know this. Mm-hmm. If you don't know this, this is the yep. hook of the song, okay? Right. Okay, we're going to do that riff, but you use, you're use you using this 
uh, strat, right. new strat. That, 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 that doesn't matter because it's all going to get filtered to the same equipment. Yes. Right. But you know what, engineer? We're going to do, we're going to pass this, this guitar on that focus right or what? That's that. That is right. That's a preamp. It's a pre brand. Yeah, the brand. What oh, brand? Brand is it? It's a voice it's, channel. Okay, we're gonna pass through the the voice channel, and then we're gonna pass it through to the amp, mm -hmm. and we're not gonna take out the line from the amp. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put a mic. Yes. Okay. And we're gonna get the natural reverb of the of the amp, and we're not gonna using this reverb or, from here. Or we're gonna put a thin pillow in front of the mic. To give it a different sound. Okay, you're getting me right. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so you be, be gonna uh, we gonna we gonna we we going to the step Mutt, one. It's and crazy, bro. Mutt Lang, Mutt Lang was doing the same thing, man. You like, will uh, know. Who, who was it? I think it was uh, Jimi Hendrix was grabbing amplifiers and and he was waterproofing amplifiers and putting them inside pools of water. Just to capture the sound of what it would sound like to record songs. That's crazy. You know, but the experiment is beautiful to see what sound you would get out of it. You know, I, I just shout out to my uh, to my friend, uh, Sire, uh, Sire uh, Hanif from uh, Masters of Maple. He he uh, he does production for like he's done like ghost teching for uh, Muse and uh, uh, Walk the Moon. Casey and, Elephant. Uh, Cage the elephant, <laughs> cage the elephant, and he's he's he has these. Uh, sometimes he does uh, photos from the studio, and I've seen where they um, they have the, the regular room is mic'd, and this is one particular location. I don't know where they were at, but there was an empty room, so they placed they ran a microphone through. It had like a small window that went into this other room, so they placed a one solitary microphone in the middle of that room which was capturing the ambience the, the ambient sound that was coming through that oh, small window this, and it which just, was a different sound which was so adding. how could you ever replicate that unless never. you didn't know that never so never. i i totally understand what you're talking about so the producer sometimes it uh help you out and sometimes if you got mixed with the wrong producer it can ruin your whole album Honestly, you're absolutely right. Honest, Adrian, you're a musician. I am. You're a successful, successful musician. Thank you. Are you happy? I am. Are I am happy. Are you satisfied? No, never. What's more important, satisfaction or happiness? Uh, I think happiness. Totally. Could you give the listeners? Three pointers on how you became a successful musician because you are a successful. Thank you. And how you became a happy musician. Can you give them three pointers? I don't have the exactly points of, of being happy or being successful, but anything that, hap that goes through your mind First of all, you know what's right and what's wrong. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not talking about music, you know? I mean, I sit up my drum kit and they told me that you need to play four fours and this kind of tempo. And you do it three fours on a different tempo, you know you're, you're wrong, right? You're wrong, right. You're totally wrong. Right. So on that specific thing, I mean, you, you just making music with yourself or with a band just never give up first of all because sooner or later something's gonna happen you not need to be the best drummer or the best musician but if you precise and do the right things you never know what the right things are talking about step by step doing music and then hooking up these shows networking doors doors open up doors open open up because you're you continue in the profession that you continue in and i think it's 
longevity, I think, is what you're telling me, is right. You keep pushing away, keep plugging away. For sure. And, right. and the guys who win the race are the, are the guys who stay in the race. Exactly. It's a marathon. And, yeah. and, 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 and that's what I always tell a lot of the guys. If, if you're sprinting, you're going to you're going to con continue you're going to you're, you're going to run, run out, out of gas of, real going to run out of gas this is this is about for me i'm running a marathon and uh, i told my i told uh i've told my bandmates before i go i'm not in the sprint i'm in the marathon and i go and this is for the long haul this is what i do in the long i think it's i think the issue and the problem that a lot of kids nowadays have is that they look at music as the gold pot as where we look at music as the love, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny because my wife gets mad at me all the time because I continuously buy music all the time mm. for the reason that I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to help the community or the music industry in a sense where I'm helping the artist by buying the music. So yeah. And I agree with you, but only if it's good music. Right. right. Now, it's still, it's, I mean, granted, it's still music that I, that I prefer, hmm. but whenever I'm driving, it's the same two or three albums that yeah. I listen to and I have listened to mm -hmm. for years. Right. You know, my wife always continues to harp on me. It's like, why do you buy so much music when you only play? It's the, always the same three to four albums that you always listen to when you're driving. Hey, gentlemen, listen, I've taken or have taken enough of you guys' time. I want to thank you so much for being here on the chapter of the Architect. JJ, my man, you know I love you to death, man. Thank you, bro. And, and thank you for giving us this platform to be able to just put a little grain of sand into this whole, this big machine, you know? Hey, listen, we. I'm going to tell you something. I was, uh, I came home yesterday from work and I had the itch to pick up that guitar and I was like, Fuck, I wish I had the guys with me. Let's jam sometime here within the next three to four weeks. Let's do it. Let's do it. Can you hey, invite me, guys? Absolutely. JJ, I'm two drummers. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick anything. I'll <laughs> Is this a three tone song? So I'll, I'll get the bass or hey, I sing my don't, part. Or don't make fun matter. of my guitar playing. Come I, on. I, I do what I can. Adrian. Come on, never. Adrian, it was, listen, it, 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 it was the utmost pleasure to have you here with us today. I, I have to say this listening to JJ talk about your experience. It's because he loves me. Yeah, but I, well, I love you now, man. Hey, thank hey, you, man. I appreciate hey, it. Hey, hey, listen, real quick before we do go, man, tell us about real quick. Tell us about playing live. Tell us about that that rush. Tell about tell us about the love of how you feel about playing live in front of an audience. There's 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 no words for that. I mean, it's an ex it's experience that I didn't quit. Never, I never quit music ever in these 20 years. I have never quit because one thing or another, I always drag back to my course of music. I, we talked about this uh, a few moments ago that I got into the universal music and the Reed record label and, and, and I, and I got a regular office job, but it was music for five years and in that moment in that time in my life i was playing locally in in monterrey mexico so i never quit and recording and on top of all the other duties yeah but uh it's if for once once you felt that that it's a drug you yes I mean, you're you're wishing to feel it back once and over again, and it's it's weird because we are humans and we eat and we sleep and we take a shit like a normal person, right? Right. So it's sometimes they got people fans, right, and, and said, "Man, you're amazing." Hey, 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 I'm just a musician, right? That try to give the best of him on top of stage and and it it vibes you it give you those goosebumps that's what i here for that's beautiful 
man, that's that's my payoff. I mean, I'm gonna get paid money. Absolutely, absolutely. But this is it's the recognition of artists. This, this is the good way of get paid and earn that money that earn night. A living. Absolutely. That night, that specific night, because sometimes you get up and you're feeling bad. You're sad because someone died in your family. Right. You're sad because, or you're mad because something happened behind stage. Right. Or you're happy. You're, right. Or you're drunk. Right. Or you're something else. Right. And people don't deserve that. Right. Because they paid to go to Absolutely. see Absolutely. Hard money. They paid. In our case, it's Mexican people who mm. work his ass, their ass off. That's right. From sun to sun. And you get there drunk or Ooh. or high or That's anything bad. else. You're cheating them. And and you you do a shit of a show bad performance and they don't deserve it because they work 15 days to waiting to this day to go watch see you and you don't give that the man, best of your you best you don't give that feedback yeah, to them that's bad business this is not okay so every time my dad told me this since uh, about this date Every time you go up on stage, you never know if you're going to back to stage again. Ooh, oh, so play like it was your last day. So always play, always play like this is your last oh, fucking freaking gig. Damn. Oh, that's so fucking beautiful, <laughs> you know? man. Tell me that ain't potent, JJ. You never oh, know. That's you got a car man. accident. You got shot. You got we we have heard and we have known a lot of cases, right? Right. During the musician, yeah. you talk about Dimebag Daryl, Dimebag or yeah. John Bonham happened wow, same the same right, that Steve man. Clark, right? Steve Clark, my hero, Steve Clark, absolutely. Ha yes. Bonham happened the same thing. Wow, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Asphyxiated. Yeah. Yes. So you never know. Wow. So if you are okay physically. Yeah. And emotionally, yeah. do the best you can because you don't know if you're going to book, you're going back up on stage again. Ever. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the words of the great Adrian. Thank you, bro. <laughs> listen, ladies and gentlemen, Adrian, what, listen, once again, thank you for being on the chapter. Of the you, should plug, you should plug your YouTube and... Um, yes, Adrian, please go ahead. Oh, I got my, my networking and my social media. It's on... I'm on Twitter as uh, Adrian G C C G. My my YouTube channel it's Adrian Gonzalez Adrian G C C G, and I'm on Instagram as Adrian Gonzalez M T Y because I'm from Monterey, Mexico. <laughs> and um, what else? My Facebook page it's a Adrian Gonzalez Baterista. It's the drummer. And hook me up. I'm I'm totally open. Uh, I love to do music. I'm not uh, professional consultation. It is a, anything, a man. studio. It, a, it could be anything. Adrian, anything. have you ever thought about giving uh, drum lessons? For sure. I've, I've been. I've, He's already booked with me. I got him booked all year. <laughs> you got him booked. For I the got next, him booked. <laughs> you got him booked for the next. I got him booked years. every every week. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these have been two. Listen, I uh, JJ is a great friend of mine. JJ Lopez, huge, great drummer, who somebody I consider a, a friend now. Adrian Gonzalez, a Thank you. Fred friend to me, who I consider right now. For sure. Great drummers. Listen, this has been chapter 40. You have been blessed to have some acoustic drummers in your motherfucking face and in your motherfucking ears. You hear me in a place to be? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is DG Architect. I want to thank you guys. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening to the chapter of the architect. DG Architect, out. DJ Architect, Architect.